World War II book, World War II Rhode Island, uh, came out in 2017, and, and the second one, there was so many great stories, untold stories, World War II, and I'll be talking about that this tonight, came out in uh, 2019. All the books are $20 if you're interested in buying them, and glad to uh, sign them, and they make great gifts, and you can read them yourself too. Um, as Ann said, thank you, Ann, for the introduction. Uh, I'm the publisher of uh, Small State Big History, Rhode Island's leading history blog. We give out an article a week uh, by various authors, not just by me. Uh, let's raise your hand. How many of you are already subscribed? I have 2,000 subscribers. How many? That's pretty good, pretty good. But there's some of you out there that are not yet signed up. So I'm going to send around this uh, a sign up sheet. And I've always gotten the pen back, which is really cool. <laughs> so, but please uh, write your name and especially make your email address uh, very uh, legible. So, but I think you'll enjoy it. Just one email a week. Okay. Uh, before I start, are there any uh, veterans of World War II out here? That would be hard. It's sad that we're losing so many. Um, how about uh, children of veterans of World War II? Funny, that's great. Good, good crowd. <coughs> Turn off all phones, especially from the phone. Grandchild. Who was in World War II? Oh, your grandfather. Okay. That's what she was that too. Right. Definitely. Uh, now, my wife tells me not to tell this joke, but I'm going to tell it anyway. <laughs> I think I might not get so, but you know what I mean? So uh, this guy at Quonset Point uh, was on Liberty, and he calls up the, uh, Jim, help me out there. What's the uh, organization that helps people? New Point. Hmm? Yeah, the Stevens Institute. So he says, uh, you know what? I forgot the joke. So. <laughs> 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 I'm 
Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Campaign? Yes, very good. <laughs> it was the campaign. So he came very late. As a matter of fact, the next day after he left, he went to Madison Square Garden and gave the rally the big ending campaign ending speech in New York City. Uh, he was the vice president. He was running with FDR, and of course, he would become president uh, soon afterwards in April. Um, here he is with uh, uh, the governor McGrath, and he's at the Providence Shipyard. Because the Providence Shipyard was an incredible facility. I think employed more people, 23,000 at one point, in, in the history of the land than any other enterprise. They built 13 Liberty ships and other ships as well. All right, I can't cover everything here. Um, but I'm going to start with um, Newport being the uh, headquarters of the U.S. Navy's Atlantic Fleet for much of the war, but a lot of you didn't even know that. Here's a great uh, photograph of us, you know, sailors learning the different parts about a ship, and that's Admiral Ernest King there, pointing. And that's him there, too. Uh, Ernest King uh, headed the U.S. Navy in Washington, D.C. after Pearl Harbor, so he was the man. And he was a strong-willed man who persuaded the Allies to provide enough Navy resources in the, to the Pacific Theater so that the Allies could defeat both Germany and Japan at the same time. There was a lot of pressure. Let's, Germany's the biggest threat. Everyone knew that. Let's finish them off first. But King said we could do both, and he was right. King was tough as nails. President Roosevelt joked that he shaved with a blowtorch, and he cut his nails with an anti-submarine neck cutter. <laughs> we'll see some of those nets, so you'll, you'll be impressed. Before the U.S. entry into the war, Admiral King was the Commander-in-Chief of the U.S. Atlantic Fleet with its headquarters right in Newport. World War II started in Europe in May of 1939. The Japanese attack, of course, occurred in December of 1941. In between that time, Franklin Roosevelt, FDR, straddled the fence. I don't know if any of you remember, but back then there was a large isolationist movement. Uh, especially in the Midwest, and coming off of World War I, the college kids had nothing, wanted nothing to do with the war. So he had to be careful, but on the other hand, he, you know, Great Britain was suffering, they needed help, and he was willing to provide some help, including allowing U.S. Navy ships to convoy U.S. merchant ships part of the way to Britain. And then the British destroyers would go the rest of the way to Britain. From Newport during 1941, King directed the undeclared warfare against German U-boats that threatened American shipping to Great Britain, including destroyers based in Newport and seaplanes operating out of newly constructed hangars at Quonset Point. Uh, they escorted U.S. supply ships on voyages to Britain, patrolled the country's neutrality zone that extended 300 miles off the coast. Uh, King said, we are no longer in peace. Time status, but of course it wasn't Pearl Harbor yet. FDR eventually allowed U.S. Navy convoys to steam all the way to Iceland, protected by American ships. And then from there, Britain would take it. It almost seemed like he wanted to provoke a war with Germany, but Hitler was very careful. He didn't want to provoke a war with Germany, so he told his U.S. commanders to not shoot at or torpedo U.S. ships. But inevitably, there were incidents that occurred. On October 31, 1941, a little more than a month before Pearl Harbor, off the coast of Iceland, a U-boat fired a single torpedo at the destroyer Reuben James. It broke it in two and sank it to the bottom. It was a loss of 115 men out of a crew of 160. The Reuben James was the first U.S. Navy vessel lost in enemy action in World War II. Uh, one of King Naval's, uh, King's aides later wrote that the deaths really shook up Admiral King. But he was undeterred and he ordered the convoys to continue and he drove his Atlantic fleet captains very hard. In November, King's stern image appeared in Life magazine cover under the caption, King of the Atlantic. On occasion, King found it necessary to take the overnight train from Kingston to the nation's capital for two weeks. Kingston, of course, is where the train station is. Uh, well, he told the staff officers in Newport, I've got to go down to Washington again to straighten out those dumb bastards once more. <laughs> Excuse me, French. Um, okay. Here's a, a great painting that the Newport Naval War College Museum has. Uh, it's a painting of the USS Augusta. That was uh, Admiral King's um, flagship. Uh, King, uh, this is standing off the Naval War College May 2nd, 1941, so before Pearl Harbor. You can see the launch coming there. Uh, King and Augusta brought FDR to meet Churchill off Canada's coast in August 1941. So 
was all a very secretive affair. And Augusta had quite a, quite a history during the war. It wound up firing its guns at, at the beach, uh, beaches of Normandy. On uh, December 7, 1941, however, Augusta was born in its usual position when the shocking news of the Japanese bombing of Pearl Harbor was brought to King. King Harbor was not on his flagship. He was at the reading room in the new quarter. Probably this had been some whiskey. It was a Sunday. Uh, he rushed over to Loose Hall to meet with his old friend, Admiral Edward Kalfus, uh, then serving as both uh, president of the Naval War College and commander, Naval Operating Base Newport. The two received what King called the latest dope from Washington, D.C. about the attack. As usual, dressed in his civilian clothes, King again took the train from Kingston to Washington, D.C. several times. Ultimately, FDR selected him to head the U.S. Navy, and he moved to Washington, D.C. King handpicked his successor, Vice Admiral Royal E. Ingersoll, to replace him as Commander-in-Chief of the U.S. Atlantic Fleet in January, as of January 1, 1942. Ingersoll hailed uh, from Indiana. His family was a long line of officers. As did King, Ingersoll also used Newport as his headquarters. He was assisted by his chief of staff, 12 members, <clears throat> and 16 junior grade officers, all working day and night. Ingersoll's aides uh, estimated that they sent more than 150 dispatches and 150 letters per day. Uh, Ingersoll organized the movements of thousands of ships across the Atlantic, carrying the men, getting ready for D-Day. He didn't lose any of those ships. That was a great uh, feat. Uh, he also oversaw the Atlantic Fleet running troop uh, transportation, transportation stores and munitions and fuel, and uh, again, and build up with Great Britain for D-Day, and also for the campaigns in Sicily and Italy and Africa. And he maintained as well a blockade on Germany. Uh, he directed the Atlantic Fleet's anti-submarine war that was a matter of primary concern in the United States, that German subs were off our, any, off our coast and were sinking a lot of our ships. Uh, but he, it was too big of a job just for Newport and his staff. So there was a big outfit in New York City called the Eastern Seaboard Frontier. And Admiral King's headquarters in Washington, D.C. had a group uh, addressing the sub German submarines as well. But his biography in the uh, Naval Command, uh, U.S. Navy official history, says, Admiral Ingersoll is generally credited with whipping the U-boat menace and with solving the vast Atlantic logistics problem. So uh, he's a pretty important guy. He uh, transferred his staff and three-star flag to the USS Constellation, which was a three-masted sailing ship. Uh, it was in Newport for many years, and I'm sure Jim has a lot of uh, postcards of it in his postcard collection. It was thought to have fought in 1812, but it was later determined to have been constructed in 1855, but still pretty old. His quarters in the captain's cabin and the stern of the frigate were furnished with antiques. He had a green rug. After departing the Constellation, he told the newspaper reporter, Personally, I've never had a more enjoyable time on any ship. Here he is uh, on the left, talking to one of his aides on the Constellation. He served uh, Newport in Newport until November 1944. With the battle against German U-boats effectively won, he was moved to the West Coast to help uh, with supplying the effort against Japan. Uh, he was a pastor guy. He didn't toot his horn like some other Navy admirals, including Admiral King. Uh, so, but I think he should be celebrated as one of the top U.S. Navy admirals in, in World War II. All right, I'm going to talk about innovation, innovation that occurred here in Rhode Island during the war. Four chapters in this book deal with extraordinary in innovation. One of them was at Chotmist Hill, perhaps the nation's most successful listening spy station established. So there's some great stories there. As a result of this listening station, German spies were caught not only in the U.S., but in Brazil, Africa, and Spain. Here's a picture of uh, the main facility up in Situ. It's a private residence now. In Woonsocket, there were fake rubber tanks, tanks that were made. They actually fooled the Germans uh, in the advance on Germany in World War II. Uh, one time, they even fooled the Americans. The Americans started firing at them. There shouldn't be anybody there. So that was not good. They had the music guys from Hollywood making all these noises and tank tracks. Uh, now, the CBs were rightfully renowned in uh, Davisville for inventing Quonset Huts. We still have some around these days. They were ubiquitous, not only in Japan uh, theater, but uh, in the North and 
Germany, Antarctica. Uh, but I uh, recently discovered that they should be just as celebrated for, some, for developing and testing pontoons in Allen's Harbor in North Kingston, in Davisville. Pontoons were the ship to shore solution for landing and supplying large forces without access to conventional harbor facilities. So you can imagine these Japanese islands, there's no harbor there. You have these big LST ships, they have tanks and they have troops and trucks, but they can't get close to the shore, so you need a smaller boat to bring them in. The pontoon system was perfected at the advanced base proving ground located at the northeast edge of Davisville off Allen Harbor. So here's a whole of stacks of uh, these uh, pontoons. They were made of steel, uh, hollow steel cube. They were welded together in a box shape, and you fl fl throw it in the water and make sure that it floated. The key was there was an interlocking system, so you could interlock them to make huge uh, uh, pontoons and structures. A pontoon assembly of six pontoons wide and eight long, or the most common size, would carry 150 ton load, just that. Now, during the invasion of Sicily, uh, here's a picture of that, uh, pontoon causeways were crucial for rapidly unloading cargo laden vehicles from LSTs. LSTs stood for landing ship tank, but soldiers called it large, slow target. <laughs> uh, typically, there were two two by thirty pontoons. You can see that the ones in the middle that being they're being used there now were two pieces. They were on the sides of the uh, ships that came in, and just as uh, they were coming to shore, the sea bees would cut off the ropes. They would float in. Sometimes the sea bees would actually float in on top of them, and they were being bombed and floating in. It was pretty crazy. Uh, then when they got to shore, they would string them together, and you can see how they could bring. Uh, the tracks and uh, troops. This was in Sicily in 1943. Even more important was the Rhino Ferry, which was designed for short cross-channel cross operations like the D-Day invasion of Normandy. It was composed of 180 interlocking standard-sized pontoons, six across, 30 long. Here's, here's one. Uh, this picture was actually released on D-Day, so, but it's showing the practice for D-Day. You can see how low they ride, you know, carrying the trucks. They would also carry tanks. And out of the LST there, just how much they could carry. That LST probably, you know, could have come from England, but originally came from the United States. Uh, in 1943, in August, CBs conducted key tests of the rhinos at the advanced base proving grounds at Davisville, which was observed by the uh, U.S. Navy and British Admiralty officers. I saw a study of that. The British loved it too, and they ordered a bunch of them. Over 85% of all vehicles landed on the American beaches of Normandy in the first 10 days came ashore on CB piloted Rhino ferries. That's, that's pretty impressive. Here's a picture of the advanced base proving grounds at Allen's Harbor. Look at all these pontoons. It's just an incredible picture. Um, you can see them all stacked together there. The, on the lower left, this is a dry dock, we're going to get to that, but these, those um, towers are each about 27 feet tall. You can't even see the human beings, they're little dots. Uh, so, uh, the dry docks, the standard was seven, 7 by 30, 215 long and 70 feet wide. Uh, the stabilizer towers, as I said, were 27 feet tall. Here's a great picture of uh, one in... Uh, Point Judith Harbor Refuge. And what would, they would do is they would put the water, uh, they would needed to fix uh, sh big ships in uh, the Japanese theater. There weren't any harbors, so they would bring these up through the Panama Canal. And uh, they would uh, put water in the, uh, in the tubes, sink, the structure would sink a little bit, then the ship would go over this structure, then they would release the water out, and the ship would come up, and they would be on and be able to be repaired. Keel blocks. Um, early in the war, it was just using PT boats, but by the end, they were servicing battleships. It was pretty incredible. In 1943, one of the war's most interesting innovations was developed at Allen Harbor, a mobile floating airfield. Codenamed Project Sock, it was introduced, uh, the idea was the concept of Winston Churchill. He said, hey, maybe we can use this for D-Day. 
Um, an experimental floating airfield called, was called a floating pontoon flight deck. It was constructed by the CBs at Allen Harbor. Here it is. Uh, it was 1,810 feet long, 272 feet wide. Measured another way, it was 312 pontoons long and 38 wide, and used a total of 10,291 pontoons. Uh, the steel flight deck was 175 feet long. And um, the, on the sides was where you could park the aircraft. And then when they needed to take off, you could put it, bring it onto the, to the flight deck. In November 1943, uh, and you can see the tugboats were used to carry it, so that's how it was moved. It didn't have its own motors. In November 1943, uh, the pontoon landing field was towed into a cove in Narragansett Bay. And with about 100 Navy officials on board, it was tested successfully. Uh, overall, a total of 100 successful takeoffs and landings were recorded in both smooth and rough waters, including night, nine at night using uh, uh, torches uh, in pots. Here's one picture of an actual landing on the airfield. There's one that's landed. You can see how they're uh, off to the side. And those are the bridges there. The, Fuel is also important, of course, to refuel the airplanes. Uh, the pontoon airfield had some advantages over aircraft carriers. There was no arresting gear. You know, aircraft carriers weren't as long, so they had these little steel cables and they had to catch them. Didn't need that here. And takings, uh, takeoffs and landings could also be explored, executed at shorter intervals. But there was further testing, and the airfield was taken out to rough water. Out out of Narragansett Bay, and it did not uh, fare well, unfortunately. So it was also realized that they needed a lot of support. They needed you know, all these people in the tugboats and the fuel boats, uh, the aircraft personnel. They needed uh, some place to live, and there's no place to live here. So uh, it would have taken a lot more effort. So they decided for these reasons to scrap the idea. But it was kind of revived in the Persian Gulf. There were actually some plans to do something like this in the Persian Gulf. A little updated, of course. All right, changing topics. Uh, another observation, uh, innovation. Spray Cliff Observatory was located on the Beaver Tail Peninsula on Connecticut Island, also known as Davestown. You can see uh, Beaver Tail Lighthouse at the front there. And way in the back on the left, you can see Spray Cliff Observatory. Uh, and Japan uh, responded to the American success by attacking Americans at night. For some reason, they were pretty effective at night in their aircraft bombings. But the Americans were not effective at defending at night. So it, uh, uh, then they started to do suicide attacks in 1944. So it was a real priority for Americans to fight Japanese aircraft at night. Uh, so the uh, Navy, the, and it was decided you really needed to develop an airborne radar that you could put on the fighter aircraft and train pilots how to use it. And the Navy teamed up with Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, at Cambridge, Massachusetts, to address the radar design issues and test airborne night fighting radar systems. So the British had invented radar, but they hadn't, and they, they were also working on this to put radar on airplanes, but they, so they hadn't yet developed that. It was called Project Affirm. There's a whole chapter on it by Virgin Carenz in, in the book. Um, highly classified. It was a real combination of private industry that, that really helped. So you can see the uh, facilities in the back there. And here's a more of a close up. These are really the only two known photographs of the site. Nothing left now. Uh, so radar pods were uh, put under the wing of radar fighter planes. And here's uh, some uh, Grumman aircraft actually flying over Rhode Island during the war. So you could see the uh, pods under the right wing. Those were, that's where the radar was, was located. Uh, it worked as follows. A radio compass site constructed north of uh, Spray Cliffs main building, so north Jamestown. Used a low frequency, low power transmitter and directional antenna to provide a radio beacon for incoming aircraft that came from the south. An aircraft with a Quonset Point with radar would conduct the nighttime tests. They would come from the south. Uh, they would connect to these radar radio signals, 
and it would enable the pilots to fly the planes directly over spray clips, radars, and, and tracking instruments. So here's an internal from a manual I got an actual how to use these. And here's a nice picture of some of the, uh, of the inside of the cockpit. The Hellcats were the, the, the ones that were the best uh, fighters for these. In November 1944, the U.S. Navy formed a Night Attack and Combat Training Unit Atlantic at Charlestown, the East Coast Primary One. And the most pilots in those days flew by the sea of their plants. Uh, but they didn't use instruments, but when it came night or foggy, they were in trouble. And unfortunately, there were a lot of accidents at night. And uh, George Bush, when he flew at night, he wrote about it. He was scared. Didn't have this radar back then, so it was, it was a scary. Um, instruments couldn't couldn't do it all the time, but radar could if you knew how to use it. So the night fighter pilots developed into an elite corps of flyers, and I met one of them. I think he was from the 1950s. After one of my lectures, he strolled up to me. You could tell he was a cocky pilot. So. In April 1945, a uh, U.S. Navy Public Relations Office tried to describe the challenges faced by Charleston trained pilots flying at night against an unseen enemy, but they couldn't mention the word radar, still top secret. So this is what they wrote. Carefully chosen for flying ability, gunnery, neuromuscular coordination, mental acuity, and personality, the cream of the Navy's exceptional flyers are sent to the Night Fighter Training Center at the U.S. Naval Auxiliary Air Facility at Charlestown, Rhode Island. Destined to fly from carrier decks and to fight and patrol while weary, they must operate under the most harrowing circumstances. Blacked out aircraft carrier decks, poor or non-existent visual aid, and difficulty of distinguishing between friend and foe in the total darkness. Never said anything about radar. Said, wow, how do they do that? They must have really good eyesight. <laughs> Some 1,500 Hellcats with night flying capabilities were produced in the war and they provided an effective deterrent against Japanese nighttime attacks. And they also were good offensively. Charlestown produced at least one ace who shot down more than 10 enemy planes. Now that's, that's how some of the tracking worked too. You can see how the, the aircraft would get behind uh, the, the, the enemy aircraft. All they could see was a little flash of orange, so you knew you were in the right direction. But the enemy could not see uh, the uh, aircraft with the radar. Uh, here's a great picture of a squadron. I was told by the Charleston Historic Society that only one pilot in the first row survived the war. So, uh, it was dangerous work, night fighter training, and there's a memorial erected. Uh, at the former Charlestown airfield, which indicates that 17 pilots were killed in uh, night fighter units, 1944 and 1945. For example, on Friday, March 2nd, 1945, at 10.15, a Grumman F6F-5N Hellcat crashed shortly after takeoff on runway 22 at Charlestown, where it exploded and burned into the ice-covered waters 500 feet offshore. The pilot, Lieutenant Kenneth Bruce McQuady, 21 years old, was killed on impact. At Charlestown today is Memorial to him and others who crashed there, including the propeller from the Quadis plane, which was recovered from the Integrate Pond in 2004. So here's a nice, uh, nice memorial. And actually, uh, one accident may have occurred in Portsmouth, uh, since we're talking about what happened in Portsmouth. Uh, there was a, a number of RAF pilots were training at uh, Quonset Point, and um, there's a cemetery, uh, Island Annex, you know, the Island Cemetery in Newport. Um, just before it, on the cross the street, on the bridge side, is a small annex and has some military uh, graves, including about eight at the end of it. So there were Brit mostly British RAF pilots who had died in accidents during the war. They had nice uh, uh, British uh, flags on them. That's also where the uh, German uh, U-boater who died off Point Judith uh, in the uh, U-boat 853 was buried. But uh, he was uh, Charles Lovely of London. 22 years old, flying on a training flight. His aircraft caught fire. He jumped out in a parachute, but his parachute didn't open. And he landed in the Scott River uh, near the uh, Stone Bridge, whether that happened in Portsmouth or Tiverton or not. 
There was uh, more innovation. These are uh, Link Celestial Navigation Training at Quonset Point. They were, pilots were taught to use the stars to navigate when the plane was out of radio range. So there were books written on this subject, how to navigate using the stars back then. Sometimes there were real old-fashioned methods were used. And here's an, an observation post at Fort Barnum in Narragansett, still there. Um, and uh, there are flags on the interior. There's all you can see, the different flags relate to different letters. So sometimes boats would approach Narragansett, the radios wouldn't work. So they would just bring out the flags and start doing ABCs. So that's uh, the old fashioned way. But uh, great to see this room and all the different flags surrounding the room. Uh, there are personal stories here too. There's a reporter from the Westerly Sun in, in this book who recalls how the newspaper became the first one to announce the attack on Pearl Harbor. So that's a great story. Marie Duggins, who I interviewed, that was a real privilege, narrates her uplifting experience as a wave in Narragansett Point. Uh, the story of her enlisting, uh, she was uh, um, at Norwich working on an aircraft factory. That was pretty good work. But one time her friends, three girlfriends, went to the movies and they saw one of these promotion films about joining the, the military. They said, you know what, we're not doing enough. Let's go join the military tomorrow morning. So they all went to the Army to enlist, uh, to their uh, uh, building, but it was closed. So they joined the Navy. <laughs> <laughs> they never saw each other again. That's how it was. Uh, Marie Duggins was assigned to Quonset Point where she cleaned aircraft engines. Aircraft carriers had their plane engines repaired and cleaned at Quonset Point regularly. Quiz. Oh, we got another quiz. How many large aircraft carriers came in the Narragansett Bay during World War, from 41 to 45? Well, during World War II. 42 to 45. Any, any guesses? About 25. 25, wow. Six. Six. Good. 25 is the highest number ever. That's, that's pretty good. Uh, one. Yeah. All of the uh, aircraft carriers went through the Panama Canal to fight Japan. They, one was used, called the Ranger. It was used for anti-submarine warfare. It was the oldest aircraft carrier. But thank you for your enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you accept, uh, here's a, a, a woman who was um, Ruth Betts. So she's working on an airplane engines as well, so she probably knew Marie Duggins. Um, yes. Hmm. I guess I don't have the picture. I forgot the picture of the... Uh, yeah, I forgot the picture of the aircraft carrier. What they... Aircraft carriers, a lot of them did come into Narragansett Bay were escort carriers. They were small aircraft carriers. At least 10 of them, different ones, came in at various times. And I'm uh, sorry I didn't make a picture, but they were very effective at anti-German uh, submarine hunting. So the, you know, the air submarines did not like airplanes going in. Because they had to ride on top of the waves a lot of the time to re reach out. All right, another story. The Kissing Sailor, George Mendoza, person right here. Now, there's a little bit of a spin here because of the Me Too movement. George Mendoza, Middletown, has been accused of assault. Now, the nurse who was a victim did say that his advance was unwanted. So, but Mendoza said he was inspired by nurses he saw taking care of his wounded comrades in the Pacific. So he had a bunch of friends who were injured, uh, they were brought to hospital ships, and, and he was impressed by how the nurses uh, took care of them. George's future wife is in the photo, smiling. Now, this is not the official photo. Um, they were married for more than 75 years. She complained later, he never kissed me like that. <laughs> Here's uh, Edward Swain Hope. He broke a uh, racial barrier by becoming the first black man to train as a CB officer at Davisville. He also became the highest ranking African American officer in the Navy during the war. Uh, one chapter, we have a chapter discussing segregation of the war. And uh, it was a lot of segregation. It's kind of shocking to me how segregated the U.S. still was during World War II. Uh, Navy ships in particular, um, most of the uh, black persons were service, you know, cooks, and, and, and the like. There was one boat that was um, all black, so that was pretty cool. But because there were so many Southerners, 
in the Navy, it was just, uh, I guess, the powers that be didn't want to stay until 1948, which was very impressive that the military was the first major segregation in this country, desegregation. Another story is uh, John Bradley, agonizing, wondering, uh, he was flying his TBF uh, Avenger, and he saw a German submarine. He knew it was a German submarine. And he races to Quonset Point, and he lands on the airfield, runs to the administrative building, talks to uh, the number two guy there, the number one guy there he thinks is in the background. But he couldn't convince him to, hey, this was really a German submarine and a threat. A few hours later, that submarine, probably it was the submarine, sunk a uh, U.S. coal ship. And 11 uh, U.S. sailors died, almost the end of the war. It was a real tragedy. And then the next day, the uh, American ships sunk it off of uh, Point Judy. Uh, there's also, um, I also had the privilege of meeting Elizabeth Sheldon before she passed away as well. Uh, she uh, would, became friends with a lot of Quonset Point officers. She would sail her, she was a great sailor, so she would sail up there. And she became engaged to one, and uh, Jim Bistado, he gave her this very bobby jacket, plus the, the pictures, plus the note. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, on the day the war ended, uh, against Japan, they were having a party at her house, and she gets a call that he's missing. And he did uh, die in an airplane crash, so very sad. But she kept these uh, all this time. And the final chapter in the book, uh, I, we have to include a lot of sites that you can visit in World War II. It's pretty extraordinary the number of sites you can visit. Jamestown, uh, Field of Newport, South County, it's, it's quite a lot. All right, I know I've said a lot already, but I'm still just getting started. We haven't even touched Portsmouth. Wasn't the deal I was supposed to talk about Portsmouth? Yeah, all right, I'm getting there now. Um, and it's, it's about PT boats at Melville. Melville had three facilities. One, the PT Boat Training Center, officially called the Motor Torpedo Boat Squadrons Training Center. And uh, then they also had the Navy Fuel Depot and the Net Depot. Mostly you kind of just tell the story through pictures. Here's a, a nice picture of um, Belleville. It, uh, February, remember December 7th, 1941, the day that we'll live in infamy, started America's uh, role in World War II, active role. And then in February 17th, 1942, Frank Knox, the U.S. Navy Secretary, said we need a PT boat training center and we're going to put it in Belleville. Now, why Belleville? Um, Probably uh, Narragansett Bay, of course, is a great place. Newport was really crowded with other facilities, so Melville became logical. Also, <coughs> these boats use a lot of fuel. The Navy fuel depots right there. Uh, Navy Newport has torpedoes. When the PT boats first started out, that was one of their main weapons, torpedoes. Most of the uh, boats were made in New Jersey, so that was also relatively close. Here's, I think this is probably the training staff. So they had about uh, 250 training staff, mostly officers, some sailors. In the front is uh, Lieutenant Commander William Spreck. So he was the main commander of the main force for the uh, facility here at, at Melbourne. Here he is here. And here's a, uh, I'm going to show you three aerial photographs. This, I'm not sure about the date on this, I would guess about 1940. So here's the, what they call the lagoon. And you can see there's a little island up there, keep an eye on that. What's also interesting about this picture is you can see ships moored in the bay. Newport didn't have a lot of wharves, didn't have these big wharves where ships came up. They, they mostly moored in the bay. This is um, probably about nine, sometime in 1942. Uh, so you, the lagoon, they did a huge amount of dredging to make the lagoon look like this. It needed to be wide, um, uh, deeper, they made it smaller. You can see some of the finger uh, wharves there. A lot of uh, Quonset huts, you can see at the end on the right side. And notice the, uh, we're going to see these in the next photograph, the three fuel uh, towers right there. Here's a, the classic picture. Uh, that was really his prime. This is probably 1944. You can see all the uh, 154 
hard terms. You can count it. Um, so, uh, excuse me, quantity huts. So they were uh, ubiquitous, of different sizes. And they had uh, they had a pool, they had a mess hall, uh, training facilities, uh, post office, all sorts. They could make all sorts of things with quantity huts. Here's uh, one of the early styles of uh, PT boats. They used to say that some people say, oh, they're made of uh, plywood, but not true. They're made of uh, mahogany, laminate, so hardwood with a steel exterior. You can see the uh, machine gun, the small machine gun in the front is an Orlicon. That was actually made in Rhode Island, manufactured in Rhode Island. The uh, Gazda, an Austrian immigrant, uh, set up shop in the Bidmore Hotel in Providence and helped oversee everything. Here's another one. You can recognize the bridge in the background, the Mount Hope Bridge. Of course, that happened quite a lot. Uh, you can see the torpedo in the back. So that was one of its main weapons in the early days. Here's a very familiar sight that we've been seeing in Narragansett Bay. Uh, just roaring up and down the bay, creating the white caps. So I talked to one uh, elderly gentleman he remembered seeing out in the bay, out in Rhode Island Sound, these white caps, and he always knew that they were PT boats running. They did uh, practice using anti aircraft guns. A lot of it at uh, Price's uh, Neck, there was where a gun facility was. I talked to one friend of the family, he remembered as a kid hearing every night, rat, 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 rat. couldn't get to sleep, the poor guy. He lived pretty close by. Here's an unusual uh, color photograph of uh, uh, in Belleville practicing with the United Craft Guns. Nice one with the flag there, too. Here's one of the um, officers. So uh, the officers, uh, one reason they needed the training was because these were small boats. They weren't that good at attacking enemy ships. They had these torpedoes, but it turned out they weren't very good. On the day that John F. Kennedy, uh, then on his uh, mission, um, he and a bunch of other boats fired these torpedoes at uh, destroyers and supply ships coming into Guadalcanal to resupply the Japanese army. None of them were. None of them hit their target. But then once they fired the torpedoes, they were sitting ducks. They were just small boats. So they were not very effective at fighting, but the men who did them were very brave, of course. They were very good at picking up uh, down pilots, um, making contact with coast washers was very important carrying uh, small groups of soldiers, you know, that kind of thing. But uh, one reason they needed to be trained was because they needed to know everything. They needed to know navigation, how to run, operate a ship. A lot of these guys didn't know how to operate a ship. John F. Kennedy liked him because he was an Ivy Leaguer and he spent a lot of time sailing, so he was good. But some of these guys had no training. Uh, they needed to know how to radar. You needed to fix and repair, you know, how to a little bit about fixing and repairing the ship, how to fire the guns. So you need to know a lot. And they did a good job of uh, training. So here's the, as you enter the facility, this is what it would look like. There's the, the sign there, Motor Torpedo Boat Squadron Training Center. Here's a line of uh, some of the Quonset Hoyt huts they would have lived in. <coughs> and here, uh, uh, look how close the, the beds are. Um, uh, one of uh, Kennedy's friends called it his, he thought there were about 20 in one constant cut, so that would have been a lot. Here he is, the handsome uh, John F. Kennedy. Of course, he uh, <coughs> trained at uh, Belleville. Um, He uh, arrived at, uh, on October 1st, 1942 as an ensign. Here he's wearing uh, the stripes of an ensign, but 10 days later became a lieutenant. Uh, he um, was assigned to Mort Motor Torpedo Squadrons 4, and he became a PT boat instructor in Melville. Uh, so he completed his training in six weeks, uh, 60 days. So uh, it's either 60 days or 90 days. At first it was 60, he was an early one. They started building the center um, at Belleville in March and pretty much completed it in July. 
Uh, so uh, did it pretty quickly. After, uh, so after his training, he actually became an instructor. So he was here from October 1st through December 7th, 19, uh, uh, excuse me, February 23rd, 1943. So almost three months. Uh, now, how did he become interested? Starts with Lieutenant John Bulkley. He was a hero. Uh, he helped, uh, he picked up uh, um, General uh, MacArthur on the Philippines after the Americans had lost, broke through the Japanese blockade, brought him and the leader of the Philippines to Australia. So there weren't many heroes back then, so they actually gave him a ticker tape parade uh, down 7th Avenue in New York. Uh, between May and September, Bulkley was uh, actually a training officer at the training center here at Melville. Uh, he spent most of his time recruiting on the road and trying to raise bombs. And one time he, uh, he met with Kennedy, he saw, you know, gave a presentation. John Harley, who was Kennedy's instructor, recalled how effective Bulkley was to his students. He told them, only one in ten of you will return from the war if you are selected to be a PT boat skipper. Then the entire group would rush forward to volunteer. And that's what 25-year-old John Kennedy did. He was at the uh, Naval Reserve Officers Training School at Northwestern University in Chicago, listened to a presentation by Bulkley and said, hey, I want to talk to you about joining. Uh, of course, uh, uh, John Kennedy had a powerful father, Joseph Kennedy. He was one of the most famous men in America. He was the ambassador to Great Britain at the time. <clears throat> so uh, the ambassador, of course, always trying to finagle things, met with Bulkley and said, hey, I'd like you to take them, but keep them out of harm's way, all right? Make sure nothing happens to them. Um, but JFK later met with him. Of course, JFK had a, had a great resume. He was also famous at the time. He had written a book uh, on how England slept. So he was famous in his own right. So he didn't really need any help from his father to, to join. He had experience, a sailing experience, Harvard University degree. Uh, so he became a Kennedy story on October 1st. One classmate recalled Kennedy sometimes inviting his fellow officers sharing his Quonset hut to nearby Hyannis to play some touch football. And another recalled uh, that Kennedy taught him how to place newspapers under his cot and mattress to help stave off the cold temperatures. So not bad for a rich kid. Um, now Kennedy didn't describe his posterities at Melville. Of course, he didn't have a real lot of chances. But uh, some of his uh, officers who served on PT boats with him did. One of them was Bud Liebenau, and he was a, in the PT boat that rescued Kennedy. He told an interviewer, I think most of all the PT officers went through Melville, and at Melville we got up at 5 in the morning, we had physical education, physical exercise, ate breakfast, and then started classes. Between each class we got, I think, a five minute break. We lived in Quonset huts, I can't remember how many we're in a Quonset hut, but it was probably, I think, maybe 20 guys. We had two lines of bunks down each side, and they were three feet apart. Actually, they were cots. We trained in Narragansett Bay, took the boats out. PT boats only operate at night, and so most of our training was done at night. Why would they only operate at night? Because they were setting targets to an aircraft, and they didn't have great defense during the day. Of course, we started out in the daytime because a lot of us didn't know what a boat was. Some of us, uh, a lot of people in the PTs were experienced sailors and Ivy League graduates like Jack, John Kennedy. And the training at Melville was very good. It saved us, I guess, so we knew what we were doing. It was rigorous training. Kennedy performed so well that his, uh, upon completing his classes in 60 days on December 2nd, he was ordered to remain as a training instructor rather than ship out to the front lines. Uh, Kennedy was assigned his first command, PT Boat 101, a 78-foot Higgins boat made in New Jersey, and he was assigned to Squadron 4, as I said. That was the biggest squadron here in, uh, in Melville, and they uh, did mostly instructing, and they also sent out boats to do uh, anti-submarine squadron. Uh, so Kennedy must have, um, you know, sped up and down there against the bay many a time. In January 1943, PT 101 and four other PT boats were dispatched to Panama, Florida. Again, not the center of the war. At this, Jack got sick of it. And there's a big question. Did Joe Kennedy, Jack's father, 
work with the Navy and say, hey, keep him out of harm's way. The, and, and is that why he was chosen as, as an instructor and then brought to Florida? Who knows? Harley, who was his main instructor, said, hey, I need a lot of good instructors to help people as much as possible, so he was, he was good to have. But Jack Kennedy had his own connections and was able to finagle uh, command out in the Pacific. Uh, so he left, uh, before leaving for his faithful cruise on PT Boat 109, he filled his crew out with a lot of recent arrivals from Melville. Um, he was one of 15 patrol boats on the night of August 1-2, 1943. He wanted to intercept those Japanese warships and supply ships, as I said. Uh, at eight, eight, uh, 2 a.m., with Kennedy at the helm, a terrible incident occurred. Now, I think it was Bud Lieberman that said, you know, Jack wasn't the biggest, strictest disciplinarian, so he didn't have somebody watching at all times. There were no one really watching out. And suddenly, it was before visibility, bad weather, but the Japanese destroyer of Amagari, traveling at 40 knots, cut PT-109 in two. And two uh, of, the, uh, of his crew uh, died immediately. Eleven others survived. Kennedy helped uh, take them to an island, a very small island in the middle of nowhere, uh, even though he had hurt his back very badly. After swimming to Nehru Island, Kennedy and his executive officer uh, found natives serving as coast watchers, supporting the Americans. Well, this was then afterwards he went to another island, and then he found these coast watchers. Kennedy wrote a message on a coconut for one of the native scouts, the Yaku Gasa, to take to the nearest Navy baby. The coconut said, 11 alive, nose to the positive position and reef, Nehru Island, Kennedy. And then Bud Liebenau's PT-157 rescued the survivors on August 8th. You can see that coconut at the uh, JFK Museum, actually, it's displayed. Kennedy Saga brought him national attention, uh, and he was proud of his PT boat service, and he used it a lot in the 1960 campaign. He actually had a, a whole sort of a pamphlet written about it, handed out for free. And Liebenau also uh, accompanied Kennedy on a lot of his campaign tours. And Biakou Gassi got to visit in the White House uh, as well. So here's uh, Kennedy's uh, crew. Here's a close-up. He's on the upper, upper level on the far left. Wasn't the tallest of the guys, but he was handsome. Here's his appointment uh, as a uh, lieutenant to Squadron 4. And here's the acceptance of it by William Sprecht. Changing topics. Um, another uh, unit that was formed was, you know, hey, these officers can't do all the repair. We need repair specialists. So motor, torpedo boat, repair, and training unit. So they, they also came here by the I love these little um, drawings they have of the different units. You can see the Mosquito. They were known as Mosquito boats, the uh, PT boats. And, and he's got the, the tools there to help fix the PT boat. Uh, now changing topic, there was also the Navy Fuel uh, Depot at Nova. That started in, uh, I believe, the 1880s, 1890s. This photograph was taken in uh, 1940. You can see it's not too busy. Um, of course, there were always ships in Newport. There was always a great Navy harbor. Now you can tell this is what it would look like if you got it, as I did from the National Archives. In the upper left, you can see September 7, 1942, Melville, Rhode Island, Navy, Fuel, and Net Depot. You can see it's a lot busier now. And here's the same source, October 31, 1943, tank area south of Melville, Rhode Island. Look at all those tanks filled with fuel. Probably in a real environmental hazard area right now. <laughs> but I hope none of you houses over there. Probably need it last time. Changing topics again. Uh, this, is, this is my favorite of the drawings. This is, there was a net, um, uh, net mining service, and they trained at Melville. So they trained to uh, handle anti submarine nets. So you can see the the squid here grabbing an enemy submarine. So here's uh, out at uh, uh, Fort Wetherill and uh, Fort Getty across the way. Uh, no, I'm sorry, that's Newport, north, just north of uh, Fort Adams. 
And you can see the net there. So the net would go down to stop the submarines from coming in. There were booms there that were supposed to stop the uh, PT boats. There were the Germans would bring a large container ship and then shoot out all these PT boats and fire a lot of torpedoes in their hands at bay. You can see the ships opening the entrance to uh, Narragansett Bay. Uh, so there, obviously there was a lot of Navy traffic and civilian traffic and they needed to go in and out. Here's a, a drawing. You can see there's actually two levels of nets. The yellow is the first line of defense and the uh, green is the second line. The yellow arrow shows Fort Adams. The orange arrow shows, shows uh, Fort Weatherall. And there's a chapter in the book uh, about how all these nets work, how the defenses work of Narragansett Bay, so it's an interesting story. And here's a map from that book. They had these uh, electronic loops that would try to pick up uh, energy from the ships. They had the uh, two lines of nets. They had mines out there. They had hydrophones listening for sounds from submarines. So they had all sorts of things out there. Here's on the west side. So that's uh, where the URI uh, oceanography is now, back then for Kearney. Uh, later, a German World War II camp, which is a great story in itself. But there's the, on the west side, and it's Fort Getty, Jamestown. Now, someone did tell me that uh, they, they, you know, they didn't allow having the openings here. We'd have to go all the way to the other side and then our fishing boat, you know, collect the fishermen. So sometimes we just go over the deck. So. <laughs> there's a friend of mine, uh, this is one of the nets that's still, you know, one of the existing artifacts of World War II. This, uh, Huge slab held the nets on one side at Fort, Fort Kearney, now URA Oceanography School. Here are the nets made of cable. This, this would be at, uh, at Melville. And more of a close up, this is 1941. And here's an interesting shot. That this is net training school. So the, the net miner boats, they actually had boats that were net mining boats, not the most active service in World War II. Uh, they were practicing how to open the two sides of the nets because there's a lot of traffic in and out, so this was training for that. And all work and no play makes Joel a, not a good fighter, so here's some recreation. Look at this pool in Melville. Very nice. Looks like a large Quonset hut. And here's a dance held at Melville. Not exactly sure where, uh, probably one of their buildings. You can see the uh, Navy net logo in the background there, this, this, this squid. Now, if you're interested in seeing a uh, PT boat, you can go to uh, Battleship Cove. There's a PT boat museum as well as the USS Massachusetts. There's a nice PT boat museum. They have two of them there and some and nice exhibits, as well as some exhibits on Melville on board the USS Massachusetts itself. That's it. So, thank you very much. Do you have to take any questions? You made, early on you made a passing reference to the uh, rubber tanks, and I'm familiar with how they were used as kind of a decoy in Normandy, but I'm kind of curious about the secretness of it here, like the security of it. You know, hmm. So what was the security uh, here? Uh, they didn't really know what it was for. They knew they were making rubber tanks, but they didn't know. Most people were just making pieces of rubber, and then they didn't know when it all came together. But uh, I, I saw some interviews with people and they said they really didn't know. Others knew it, but they were told you have to keep it very secret. So it was not very well. Of course, all those posters of loose lips, lips sink ships. You, know, so. you mentioned the uh, pontoons and the rhinos. Uh, as the daughter of a CV, I think that's a pretty great innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, but are they at all comparable to the Mulberry Harbor used uh, off Normandy, specifically like mm -hmm. an Alamanche? Oh, good question. The Mulberry Harbors at Normandy were important. They were, uh, those were British inventions. So those were huge, massive pieces of concrete. And uh, unfortunately, you know, the main thing about uh, uh, the invasion was to get huge numbers of troops, supplies, fuels, tanks, trucks, you name it, over onto the continent. So it took more than just one day in Normandy, and it took you know, months to get everything going. 
But unfortunately, uh, three or four days after Normandy was one of the worst storms in decades in the North Sea, and they tore apart the Mulberry bridges. So they weren't much good after that, unfortunately. But it wasn't that was an important innovation too. Uh, but most of them were not usable after that storm, unfortunately. But the sea beast came through with the rain. Good for you. The, I, I never saw those flight decks before. That, um, the flight decks? Yeah. The mobile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Did they use them in Europe? Or did they uh, use them anywhere else besides? No, they didn't make any anywhere else other than the Narragansett Bay. So, a first. <laughs> but it was never used in battle or anywhere else. Because they took it out to there in the ocean and it got beat up too badly. So, they so decided, was it primarily for practicing going off and on? I mean, they were hoping it would work you know, off of Normandy, and maybe in, yeah. you know, in the Pacific where the waters were typically more calm, it could yeah. have worked off an island or something like that. But uh, they decided to scrap the idea. But very interesting innovation. Yeah. The, uh, Prudence Island bunkers. Prudence Island bunkers. Yeah. Did they have this after um, the invasion of Pearl Harbor? They, did they take all the ammo off the ships in Newport and store it in the bunkers over on Prudence Island? I'm not sure. Uh, I, don't, I don't know a lot about Prudence Island. I think that a lot of it was actually fuel depots. They had a lot of bunkers. In Prudence Island, a lot of it was for fuel. Uh, there was an island off of Quonset Point, I think it was called Hope Island, that they put a lot of ammunition in. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, look, I have a map of Prudence Island. A lot of it was owned by Vanderbilt back then, so they probably didn't like that as land being used for these sources. But uh, yeah, that's an interesting area to look into. I mean, you, you can look at uh, you know Rose Island and see it in from the bridge uh, that was quite built up during World War II uh, as well, and all, all the islands were. And why did the Navy leave? Uh, why did they leave? Yeah. <laughs> Politics. <laughs> Nixon administration. Well, the Navy had to come back, and uh, the Southern congressmen were very powerful back then. They would serve for 30, 20 years of seniority system, and Rhode Island got the, the, the short end of it. Because of the bridge? That I don't think so. No. 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 That was an excuse. That was an excuse at the time. But yeah. Because a Massachusetts didn't vote for Nixon. Massachusetts didn't vote for Nixon. Well, Rhode Island didn't vote for Nixon. Well, yeah, exactly. Rhode Island didn't vote for Nixon. Massachusetts didn't vote The Southerners controlled the committees. So. That was my um, college news from the paper at Brown University. That uh, listening post up on Unicanica Hill, but not Unicanica, but New Neck Hill uh, in Situate, that was just opposite the driveway of, of Lieutenant Governor John Foparelli. Uh, and I know it was there as of in the 60s, uh, maybe as long as the 70s, and it might still be there. They might have preserved it, but um, that, it was all fenced in and what have you. And, uh, and, and it was, um, I became aware of what it was used for mm. after the war, you know. Yeah. But, uh, there's some, the listening post is situated, uh, there's some, some interesting stories, and if you go there, you, you can listen to enemy uh, radio broadcasts. Is it open now? Or no, it's private. It's private. It's private now. Yeah. But you'd have to listen to enemy broadcasts, very faint signals, tip you know, ting 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 People would start going crazy, so they could only they determine, you know, you could only do that like every other day or something like that, because people were actually going crazy. Uh, so. As far as prudence goes, the southern one third of prudence was ammunition storage, and it's uh, part of the National Estuary now, so by the state, but it you still could see some of the ammunition bunkers were there. When I was in the Navy, we, we stopped there one time to offload our ammunition here at a uh, yard period or something. And uh, they had all these ammunition bunkers. That whole bottom one third was, uh, was, was ammunition storage. And it was in coordination with you know, the, the torpedo station and all the other Navy facilities in the, in the bay. Thanks, John. Speaking of which, um, 
over on Beaver Tail uh, by the lighthouse, there's all sorts of what looks like gun emplacements or something like that. I don't yeah. know when those date from, or is that World War II? They were World War II. There's a lot over in Jamestown, actually. Uh, Even before that, I think that was uh, 1900. It was an awful lot of Well, Island. there was, uh, if you're talking about Fort Weatherwell, that was, I think that was World War I, in the 1890s. Uh, I was walking along uh, uh, Mount Tree Point, one of the most beautiful spots in the island, near Watch Hill. There's Fort Mansfield there in the dunes. It's, it was built in the, for the Spanish American War. <laughs> but uh, at Beaver Tail itself, it was mostly that was World War II facilities. There were some batteries there and that kind of thing. And there's a lot of underground mines. And I think there's buildings. still one building left that was involved in that uh, the planning of, uh, of air defense of the fleet. It's right now, it's occupied yes. by the state, and it's got a whole forest full of antennas. Right, right. Uh, that was the headquarters building. Actually, it's leased by the guys. It's, you've been there, lived there for a long time, and rent since then. They haven't got a tour of it yet. The pontoons that they used to bring in trucks and tanks and things, so they had no motors, they just drifted in on the Good question. Did the pontoons have motors? Yes, uh, the rhinos did. They had very uh, slow motors. So sometimes they had to be tugged by uh, tugboats. Uh, but they did have some motors, yeah. but not real powerful ones. On the topic of presidents in Newport, I suggest that President Eisenhower should also be added to your list. Eisenhower House over at the fort was the summer White House for a couple of years. It and was when he was president in 1950. Yeah, but when I was a young girl, I remember seeing him mm -hmm. uh, sailing by Battery Park where really? my family was having a picnic. Mm -hmm. And so he, I think he could be out of jail. Well, it's got to be during World War II. Yeah. So there's that. <laughs> <laughs> but there's an Eisenhower house that's great. Yeah, Battery Park, people remember seeing FDR. He took a, a, a small boat from. Uh, from the wharf area where he toured some torpedo facilities at Goat Island and took a small boat across the Naval War College. Yeah, what did Eisenhower have to do with World War II anyway? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was just a job. Yeah. All right, uh, I'd be glad to uh, sell anybody any, any books and sign them $20 each to so keep it simple. And uh, thank you very much. Anybody who either lives on Aquidneck Island now or grew up on Aquidneck Island has some connection to the military. Um, and I, on how many census records did you see? You know, your parents, if they weren't in the military, they worked at the torpedo station, right? Uh, I think everybody has a family member that worked at the torpedo station. Goat Island still has bunkers and some unsafe areas. The pictures of Goat Island um, when it was built up are incredible. Unrecognizable. There's one building still there. That's the Regatta Club. Um, you might be familiar with it. 